Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. Operation is, is a fun game, right? Uh, at least for some people. Like I said, I'm not really a big fan. Operation is a fun game, though. But having surgery is actually not fun, right? Like, even something minor is not enjoyable. Even, you heard from Jeff, uh, a broken ankle is something that, that, that's painful, but it's fairly common, right? But he had to have surgery to kind of fix all that stuff, and now he's laid up for a long time. Having surgery is a big deal. It's not a minor thing at all, is it? And I think one of the things that makes it really kind of a big deal is that it's not something that just anybody can do. Like, I can't go and operate on somebody, and you wouldn't want me to. I'm not trained. I'm not capable of that. And why is it so complicated? Well, if you're trying to remove something or, or put something in, there's not like a little buzzer that goes off when you've hit the wrong thing, like an operation. No, there's muscles, and there's bone, and there's nerves, and there's blood vessels, and there's all this stuff that surgeons have to navigate around in order to actually fix the real legitimate problem that they have. Operation. Now, I'm going to make a little bit of a leap here, but sometimes I feel like helping people and serving people and doing what the Good Samaritan does is almost, in our day and age, feels a lot like doing surgery. Because we live in a culture that's so politically correct that it almost feels like I'm going to do the wrong thing when I try and help somebody more than it feels like I'm going to do the right thing. And so I'm a little afraid to engage with people that aren't like me or aren't the same way as me. And there's just so many demands. There's demands everywhere. And I feel like I need to be an expert on a subject before I go and help other people. And so I feel like it's actually safer and it's better if I just sit this one out. Because I'm just going to make a mess of things. And I'm not going to do it. And in fact, it's really kind of difficult, again, kind of like playing operation. Sometimes when you have to help somebody, it feels like you have to be so precise. And if you do just the wrong thing, it's going to go, eh, and you, your service is rendered useless and doing more harm than good. In fact, there's a book called When Helping Hurts. When Helping Hurts. And the premise behind the book is how short-term sort of missions and things like that can actually, if we don't do them the right way, be more damaging than helpful. And I, and I agree with the premise of the book. There, there are things that we do when we try and impose sort of our Western values on cultures that aren't quite ready for that or, or don't want that at all uh, with our mission trip. So I understand uh, the premise of the book and I agree with it. But I think a side effect is, again, this feeling that I can't actually help people unless I become an expert in their culture, in their way of life, in their language, and all this other stuff. And I don't think that's true. So where do we draw the line when it comes to loving other people? Where is the line? Where is, it, where is this overwhelming sense of, of not being able to help people coming from? And where do I draw the line and say, okay, these people I can help and these people I can't? Because it's overwhelming the amount of demand that's on our life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about where we draw the line when it comes to loving other people. We're continuing on in our study, the parables, and we're in Luke chapter 10. So if you've got a Bible or a phone or a Bible app on that phone or a tablet or something, uh, you, can, you can look that up. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 10. And, and like Justin said, this is one of the, if not the most famous parable of Jesus. This is the story of the Good Samaritan. It's kind of right up there with the prodigal son, depending on which one. It's like 1A and 1B. And we're going to see, again, how Jesus answers this question of where do I draw the line. And we're going to see that our excuses condemn us, compassion costs us, but grace goes after us. So let's start with excuses condemn us. Chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? 
Let's stop right there. We ask for permission not to love people. That's one of the ways our excuses condemn us. We ask for permission not to love people. The religious leader here is not asking a genuine question. If you've heard me teach on the parables so far before, I've brought up that whenever somebody asks Jesus a straight question, they typically get a straight answer. So when the disciples say, hey, whoa, what do these parables mean? They typically get them explained. This is a genuine question. He really does want to know how to inherit eternal life. The problem is he's doing it to try and entrap Jesus. He's trying to catch him so that they can bring charges against him and convict him. But, but really, what happens is Jesus is the one that catches him. And the first thing he does to put him on the hook is he asks him, what does the law say and how do you read it? Now, back in the day, back in this time period, they wouldn't just go straight to Scripture. You would quote other rabbis. You would say, well, this rabbi said this about how to inherit eternal life. This rabbi rabbi said that about how to inherit eternal life. And so Jesus kind of cuts through all that and says, how do you read the law? What's your way of understanding it? And he quotes Deuteronomy 6.5 to him, and then he quotes Leviticus 19.18. Those are the two passages that are, are kind of combined here in the religious leader's answer. And he answers correctly. Jesus says, great job, that's the right answer. And then what does he tell him to do? Do this and live. Do this and live. Now, is Jesus all of a sudden putting forward like a works-based sort of salvation? Did we just discover like a heresy in, in Scripture and not realize it? No. Jesus is saying that if you do this to the utmost, to perfection, you will live. If you go and do these things, you will absolutely live. And again, what does it say? He, verse 29, but he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Again, we have somebody trying to justify themselves before God. What does Galatians 3.10 say? It says, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. All things written in the law and do them. You have to obey the entirety of the law in order to be righteous. So how do I inherit eternal life? The man's answer here is, I need to love the Lord my God with everything that I have, and I need to love my neighbor as myself. And the implication is every single time. Every single time that opportunity comes up, I need to do it to the best of my ability as I love myself and with my whole heart, my whole mind, my whole soul, everything I have devoted to loving God and loving other people. And if you miss one time, you've broken the whole law and your eternal life is not for you. You don't get it. And Jesus says, you've answered correctly. You do that and you live. Now, the right answer here, the right response wouldn't be seeking to justify yourself. The right response would be, well, nobody can do that. Nobody can love God with everything they have at all times because we're selfish and we make mistakes. We screw up. Nobody can love other people just completely and totally as they love themselves. That's impossible. I have times where that phone lights up and it's that friend that's going through a tough problem and it's like 10.30 at night and I don't want to answer the phone because I don't have time, I'm tired, and I just let it go to voicemail. I hope that wasn't too confessional. <laughs> let it go to voicemail. And I, I can't do that every time. We do this all the time. We ask for permission not to love. The religious leader is looking for the scope of who he has to love to be reduced down, which is funny because he's implying that he loves the Lord his God with everything he has. That's not his question. He's like, I got that covered. What I don't have covered is who's my neighbor? Who are the people that I'm responsible for? Make that group smaller so that I don't have to care about everyone. And we do this all the time. Who looks like me? Who votes like me? Who thinks like me? Who worships like me? And we ask these questions, and we're, we're, we're classy people. We don't ask these questions out loud. Come on. But we ask them internally, and what's funny is our culture actually gives us answers. Because if you turn on TV, you have the Kardashians and you have commentators telling you who's cool and who's not, who you're supposed to love and who you're not. We have actors and athletes telling us what causes we're supposed to support and which ones aren't worth our time. We even have pastors and politicians saying, these are important issues. You need to care about these. Don't worry about this other stuff. This is the most important thing. And they're answering a question that we have implied in everything about our culture and our society. Who do I have to care for other than myself? And who can I ignore and leave alone? 
tell me where I'm supposed to draw that line, that boundary. And it's okay, because when we don't get the answers we want, we also give ourselves permission not to love other people. So if we don't get the answers from other people, we also get our, give ourselves permission. Look at the story Jesus tells. 29, but he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Which is what they did to Jesus, by the way, in case you didn't notice. They beat him, they strip him, and they leave him half dead for the Romans to finish off. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And so likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he too passed by on the other side. So a man is accosted by robbers. He's accosted by people that, that mean to do him harm. And, and the roadway from Jericho to Jerusalem, that little stretch of road is kind of mountainous, kind of windy, and there's a lot of caves to hide in. And so it's very, very dangerous. And in fact, according to some commentators, I've never been to Israel, uh, it's apparently very dangerous even to this day. There's lots of places to hide, lots of people, places to have an ambush. And so these guys beat him, take everything he has, and they leave him there to die. And then it says something. It says something really neat. It says, by chance which in the story is a little bit of a twist. It's almost like a, a, a hint of optimism. It's like, fortunately, like just kind of happenstance, a priest is going down the road. And you're like, oh, this guy's a priest. Like he's a religious person. He's going to help. But what does it say? He passes by on the other side. A Levite who's kind of uh, not a full priest. Uh, he's, he's kind of helping out in the temple. Uh, he's coming and he doesn't help either. Now, it doesn't give us really a reason why they don't help. Because that's kind of not the point, right? It's just the fact that they don't help. All sorts of things have been thrown out. Maybe they're afraid of uncleanliness. So if a priest or a Levite touches a dead body, then they become unclean and they can't actually do the work and worship necessary for a priest or a Levite to do. Maybe it's safety. Maybe they're afraid that those robbers are kind of laying a trap with a half-dead man and they're going to try and lure other people into an ambush. And so they're like, oh, whoa, it's, it's not safe here. I'm going to keep going. Or it could be that they didn't know what kind of person this was. Maybe he's a Jewish brother or sister and we need to help that person. Or it could be a godless Samaritan or a godless Gentile and I'm not obligated to help those people so I'm just going to keep going. I'm not even going to go over and look to make sure I know what kind of person this is. No reasons given. And the point of the parable is the Levite and the priest give themselves all the excuses that they need. And our excuses condemn us because we do the exact same things. It might be inconvenient to help other people, so I don't. Like, I got a really, really busy schedule. I don't think you know what my week looks like. I got to take kids here. I've got to go places there. I've got, I've got really, really a busy project at work right now, and I just don't have time to help other people. It's inconvenient. Or it might entangle me with the kind of people that... I don't really want to associate with. Now, again, we would never say that out loud. But to ourselves, it's like, I don't really like that group of people. I don't connect with them, and they're kind of awkward, and so I don't really want to involve myself with them. It might cost me the resources that I've built up for myself. I've worked really, really hard, and I don't want to put those resources towards somebody that maybe has made a, a hash of their life, and I, they're just going to ruin everything with the money that I have. So I'm not going to give it to them. I'm not going to give those resources. They're not worth the time the effort, and the money. It might hurt me. Again, safety might be a concern. I, I don't want to... I've heard South Dallas is rough. I've never actually been there. But I've heard people say that South Dallas can be a scary place, so I'm not going to go. I'm going to stay away. I'm going to stay in my safe neighborhood. We ask this question all the time. We ask the same question the religious lawyer asks. Who is my neighbor? And under our breath, we say, please, God, not this person. Who is my neighbor? Please, God, not this person. My wife and I were in the emergency room uh, recently. She uh, struggles with migraines, and she kinda went, they kind of went away uh, after our daughter was born, but they've kind of come back. And so uh, they wanted to test her for meningitis, and so they sent her uh, to the emergency room. And, I mean, emergency rooms, I, I think, are pretty much all the same uh, for the most part. Nobody enjoys going to them. Uh, at all. But we're sitting there, and as we're sitting there, people are coming in and out, and I'm trying to get some work done because uh, it's a Monday, and I'm trying to catch up on some things. I think I was writing a, a sermon or a lesson or something like that. And this man walks in uh, holding, like, something to his head, and it's, it's red, and so uh, the cloth, I think, was naturally white, but what he's holding is red now, uh, and he's bleeding. And so they bring him back, and they kind of bandage up his head a little bit, and they sit him in the, uh, in the waiting room with us, I guess, for stitches. And he sits across from us, 
And I find out that what happened was uh, he works in a restaurant and a champagne bottle exploded and put a three-inch gash sort of in his head. So as we're sitting there, my wife is dealing with migraines and is in an incredible amount of pain. The guy across from me is bleeding. And we're trying to figure out what the system is for them to take people back. Because it's not first come, first serve. Because my wife and I have been there for a long time, and other people that haven't been there as long are going back before us. It's clearly not severity of injury, because here's a man bleeding out of his skull. Again, not a doctor, but that seems serious to me. And he's not going back. So this guy and I and, and, and Kim, we start kind of bantering back and forth about what the, what the system is. And I began to feel a little bit of like, hey, this is a good opportunity for you to, to share the gospel with this guy. And maybe not even share the gospel. Just tell him you're a pastor. Somehow work it in. You know, we, we're really, really good at working in what we do into conversations. You know, work it in and, and ask him where he goes to church and see where the conversation takes you. And I would love to sit here and tell you that that's exactly what I did, and he's sitting on the front row, and we're going to do this interview. That's not, <laughs> that's not what happened. What happened was I sat there and I said to myself, I've got a lot of work to do. I'm already missing half day of work with my wife uh, out here, and, and, and I just don't have the time for this, and I don't want to do this, and it's kind of awkward. He's bleeding. He could be lightheaded. I mean, all sorts of excuses, and my excuses condemn me as not recognizing who my neighbor was in that situation. Because here's your neighbor. You want to know who your neighbor is? It's whoever's around you that has a need. And I was just like the priest or just like the Levite. I wouldn't even go over to the man and see if he was the kind of neighbor that I needed to reach out to spiritually. I let it pass. I let the opportunity go. He was around me and I didn't help him. We can't serve people like we want to or like we're called to serve people because the law is too demanding. The standard is too high. I can't do it perfectly every single time. And what's more is it wouldn't be that bad if it just sacrificed a little bit, but compassion actually costs something. Compassion costs me something. What does compassion cost? Let's look at the Samaritan and see what it costs him. 33, but a Samaritan as he journeyed came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. That word compassion means uh, like your innards go out to them. So the way we would render that is his heart went out to him. So his heart goes out to him. And he went to him and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Let's stop right there. Compassion costs us a lot. Now I'm going to look at this over a time span. So our compassion costs us our yesterdays. Our compassion costs us our yesterdays. Who's the Samaritan? He's one of the most despised people in Jewish society. This is, the kind, this is the person, his family, his people group, were the people that stayed behind when Judah was exiled to Babylon. They stayed behind, and Babylon only took the smart, the educated, and the wealthy. So this guy would be, Jewish people would have thought of him as poor white trash. Like that's who this guy is. He's nothing. He's nobody. And those people that stayed behind intermarried with other people that stayed behind that weren't Jewish people, and they created this race of people called Samaritans. And Jewish people looked on them and considered them to be dogs. To eat with them would be the same as a Jewish person eating pork. And to take anything from them would have been a violation of the law. Samaritans were looked down on. And this guy shows up, his heart goes out to this man, and it costs him. Look at all the stuff it costs him. He bind, bind, binds up his wounds. Binding up the wounds, this guy probably wasn't rolling around with a first aid kit. That's probably his own clothes he's ripping up to bind up the wounds. The oil and wine were, were for cleaning out the wounds, and that's his own stuff. His own animal is used. It cost him his yesterdays because think about all the time it took, all the resources it took to buy that stuff over time. He worked really, really hard to have his own animal. He worked really, really hard to have his own clothes. He worked really, really hard to have his own oil and wine that probably wasn't intended to be poured out for the use of somebody that wasn't able to pay him back. All those days, all that time, all that energy he spent building up and accruing those resources was lost on a man that not only he didn't know, but didn't like him, that hated him. This would be like a, a black man in the 1950s doing all of this for a guy wearing a Klan robe. Or for a Jewish man in the 1940s caring for a Nazi. This man hated him. And the Samaritan went through great lengths, sacrificing 
all these resources that he had built over time to take care of somebody that hated him, hated his guts. Somebody else that sacrificed a great deal is Jesus Christ for people that hated him. It says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still at war with God, Christ died for us. While we were still enemies, Christ died for us. So when you were born, you were ambushed by sin, and they robbed you of of eternal life. That is the consequence of being born in this world. You inherited a, a, a genetic disease from Adam and Eve called sin, and it stays with you. And the only thing, as Justin said, that can take it away is either you dying or someone dying in your place. And the person that dies in your place has to keep the law perfectly. That loving God with everything you have and loving others as yourself, somebody has to do that perfectly and then has to die in all of our places. And that's exactly what Jesus does. And if you believe in that, if you say, hey, I can't do this on my own, if you're not like the religious lawyer who tries to justify himself, but instead you look at that standard and you're like, I can't do that, I need somebody to do it for me. And you look to the cross and you say, you know what? I'm going to put my faith and trust in what Jesus did for me. I'm going to believe that for my salvation rather than relying on myself to do it. It's, the Bible says you'll be saved. The Bible says you will have eternal life if you trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And all those yesterdays that you spent away from God will be redeemed and will be used for something good and glorious in the future. Compassion costs us our yesterday. It also costs us our tomorrows. Look at verse 35. And the next day he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Whatever more you spend. This guy may have had ideas or plans for that two denarii, but you know what? doesn't matter. I'm going to spend it. I'm going to pour it out on this one guy. Two denarii would have bought him about 24 days in the end. Can you imagine spending money for somebody that doesn't like you to put them up in a hospital for 24 days? My wife was in the hospital for three with our baby, and we paid that off for a long time, even with insurance. Imagine 24 days of a hospital stay without insurance for somebody that doesn't like you. Not only would I do, I think very few of us would do that. I don't know that many of us can afford it. It's very expensive. Compassion may cost you. It may cost you your future plans. It may require you to give up your future Saturdays. It may require you to give up evenings and mornings. It might make you give up your dreams for yourself. Maybe there's something in your life that has called you to be a missionary or a pastor or something like that. But you're like, no, 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 no. my family's always been this or my family wants me to do that but maybe God is calling you to something greater, something different. It may just be lunch. You may have to just give up lunch to go spend it with somebody who's lonely and needs you. Compassion also costs us our nows. Compassion, compassion costs us our nows. Verse 36, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Again, He reiterates, you go and do likewise. But we've seen you can't do this. Jesus says, go do it now, but you can't do this. The funny thing is, where do you draw a line around who you're supposed to serve? Travis, you didn't answer this question. In fact, you told me I'm supposed to love everybody to the utmost of my ability. So where do I draw the line? The trick is you don't draw the line about around who you serve. You draw the line around all the other stuff that makes you incapable of taking advantage of those opportunities. Our schedules are packed. Our resources are stretched to their max. We live in homes we can barely afford. We keep schedules that we barely can manage. I mean, if we didn't have these things, I don't know that we would really be able to get anywhere. You draw a line around those things. You start downsizing your life. And you say, you know what? I don't know that we can do this anymore because we're missing out on the margins, the areas where God can work, those spaces and those gaps. That's where we can draw the line. And to be motivated to do that, you've got to have grace. You've got to have the grace of God living in your heart because grace goes after. Grace goes after. If you've experienced God's grace, it will motivate you and push you to go after other people. Sam and I were talking about what is it that makes a hero motivated to go into danger? This is Memorial Day weekend, so we talked a lot about soldiers really, really thankful. I was in the army for eight years, and I'm really thankful for those that that have died 
serving our country, veterans that have passed away. But what is it that makes that person go? Some of it, I think, is training. Again, being in the Army, we trained for that. You kind of just get used to the idea of putting yourself in that situation. So you kind of get trained for that. But I think there's something else there. There's some other motivation. And for the Christian, it's grace. For the follower of Christ, it is grace. Grace is what sends me into the burning building of another human being's life to pull them out and bring them the gospel. That is what grace does for me. Grace goes after it, pushes me to pursue. So what do I do with this? Start looking for somebody in your life that you can just pursue. Somebody that you know has needs. Go after them. Find out what they need and meet it and decide, you know what, I'm going to meet it whatever it is. I'm going to go after it. Just pick one person to pour out just overwhelming generosity and love on them. And then find a place here in the church to serve. If you're like me, I've been in church for a long time and I've been told I need to serve in VBS for about as long as I've been alive. I get that. I get that sometimes we get tired of hearing that message over and over and over again. I was that way last year, and I had a guy on our staff, David Huey, the family minister, was like, hey, let's serve in a class together. And I didn't have a kid at the time, and so I was kind of terrified of children. I didn't think they would like me very much. And I had an absolute blast. It was so much fun. It was me, David, and Ryan Woodall. We, we had a blast serving uh, with some great kids. You might not have a whole week you can give. It's a half a day. Go one day for half a day. It's well worth it. Volunteer. They need help. Those kids are people within your sphere that you can serve. And when we offer up our excuses, our excuses really condemn us. They tell us that we are really selfish. And I know compassion is going to cost you something. There's no way around that. But real grace goes after people. And if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, if you have the grace of God in your life, you'll go after people too. And you'll start drawing lines around the other stuff that infringes on the opportunities you have to serve. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for today, uh, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you that we have an opportunity to serve in our church and to love well, Lord God. Thank you for what you've done for us. I pray for each person here, and I ask that you would do something in their lives. If they don't know you, if they're separated from you, if they're, they're far away, Lord God, I pray that they would come to know you, and that they would put their faith and trust in you. If there's somebody uh, that have walked with you for a while, but just kind of feel a little burnt out, a little tired of serving, Lord God, I pray that you would restore their spirit, that you would fill them with your grace, and that, that they would know that what they do matters, and it's significant, and it's not something that they can just put off anymore. I pray, Lord God, that you would work through the rest of our Sunday and the rest of our week I pray that we would have good rest today so that we can continue to follow you this week. And we ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.